Paul Karras is undoubtedly one of the greatest chess players to ever live, but in this game against Bobby Fischer from the 1959 Candidates Tournament, he commits a couple of chess sins. At least, they were sins when played against the great Bobby Fischer. A very enjoyable game. I think you're going to like this. Let us jump right in. Paul Karras has white, Fischer has black, and Karras begins with e4, grabbing the center, c5, the Sicilian defense played by Fischer. He pretty much always played the Sicilian against e4. Knight f3, d6, d4, cd4, knight d4, and knight to f6, attacking the e4 pawn. So knight to c3 is played to defend the pawn. And a6, the Nydorf variation of the Sicilian, keeping a piece out of b5 and later playing uh, b7, b5 himself is the idea. And Karras plays bishop to g5. This is, uh, even to this day, probably the most aggressive line against the uh, Sicilian Nydorf. And basically, the idea is to capture on f6, create some pawn damage, and allow this knight to jump into d5. Black rarely allows that, and goes ahead and plays e6, and uh, that way the knight can be recaptured by the queen if it's taken. f4, advancing in the center, preparing to either play e5 or f5 with aggressive intentions. Bishop to e7 takes the pin off the knight. Now queen to f3. And this f3 square is a nice post for the queen. It can play on the f-file. It also puts some pressure down this light square diagonal if after the b-pawn moves, that rook at a8 could hang. Queen to c7 is played. If b5, then e5 is the idea, right? Attacking the knight and the rook. Queen to c7 was played. That stops that because of e5. Black can then play bishop b7, counterattacking the queen. So it stops that idea. Castle long. Knight b to d7, getting that last minor piece developed and shoring up the knight at f6. Bishop to e2. Uh, is played. Often that bishop will go to d3. It's a little more aggressive there. From e2, it can does a better job maybe of supporting the g-pawn advance. b5 is played with the threat of hitting the knight at c3, loosening the defense of the e4-pawn. And here Karas makes a very interesting decision. He takes on f6 with the bishop. Now that's not unusual. Knight f6, e5 is played. Now he's hitting the knight and the rook at a8. And Bobby Fischer plays a very reasonable move. He plays bishop to b7. That's the standard idea. And a, a normal response from white would be queen to g3. After d e5, pawn takes, knight d7, queen g7, queen e5. Black is a bit better already here with the, uh, the bishop pair and the threat of playing b4 and getting some uh, pressure on the white king. Although white isn't lost by any stretch. But this is the first chess sin that Karas commits, he makes a queen sacrifice, really a positional queen sacrifice. He gets good material, but he gives Bobby Fischer a roaming queen on an open board. That is definitely a mistake. So he goes ahead and takes the knight at f6, bishop takes queen, bishop takes f3. Now the bishop at f3 is attacking the rook at a8. Uh, rook to c8 to save that rook would actually not... Uh, be the best after pawn takes bishop b4, putting pressure down the half open c file. If the knight moves to e2, you see the knight at d4 defends c2, king takes e7, and this is a fairly equal position. But Fisher, of course, wants more. So he actually gives up that rook by playing bishop takes f6, bishop takes a8. Now, he's actually seen fairly deeply into this position. Computers today show us that queen c4 is probably the strongest move, with the threat of playing b4, kicking this knight away, and then taking on a2. One possible line is knight to e4, obviously threatening a fork at d6, but black would take on a2. Then knight f6, g f6, uh, but in this position, black is, black is better. But Fisher has another interesting idea. He plays the move d5, imprisoning the bishop at a8. It can't get out, right? So what uh, Karras decides to do is give up the bishop for a pawn and an open e-file. So he takes the pawn at d5, and uh, obviously the idea is that when black retakes, then the rook can check and the king might be in some trouble. The first thing Fisher does, though, before taking the bishop, he takes the knight, because that knight could cause a lot of problems, particularly after it can move to the f5 square later, after the bishop was taken. Rook d4, e d5, knight d5, hitting the queen on c7, queen c5, and rook to e1, check. 
And it looks at first glance as if Karras has gotten sufficient compensation uh, for the queen's sacrifice, and he probably has, to be truthful. And there's some danger for Fisher here. If he were to play king to d7, then after c3, sort of solidifying the position, say king to c6, rook to e7, with the threat of rook to c7 uh, check, winning the queen, Fisher would be in a, a lot of trouble. And that is why, instead of that, he plays the king to f8 and tries to find another way to activate this rook on h8. c3 is played by Karras, and he has achieved equality, to be fair uh, to him, uh, but Fisher still has that queen on the board. Fisher plays h5. Uh, that controls the g4 square, but it also allows the rook to become activated via h6. f5 is played, rook to h6, and now uh, this puts some pressure on f6, can move to d6, and Karras makes a strong move here. He plays the move f6, sacrificing a pawn, but it wrecks black's pawn structure and allow his, allows his knight to get a very nice square. After gf6, the knight moves to f4. This is a very comfortable square for the knight. Um, it's very hard to get at it. White would like to play h4 and g3, where that knight would be almost permanent and continue to put pressure on the h5 pawn. And because of that, Fisher plays h4. So he can't get that set up with h4 and g3. Uh, and if pawn, the pawn goes to g3, he'd take it, and then the pawn on g3 would be vulnerable. Now, here is where Karras commits the second sort of chess sin in this game when it comes to playing against Fisher. Uh, the move a3 controls this b4 square, gives white a stable position, and this position is fairly equal. But Karas was unsatisfied. When you intentionally sacrifice your queen, I mean, you want more. You want to get the maximum from the position. However, here, he really didn't have a right to push. And against Fisher was so deadly accurate in his play. And if you pushed when you didn't have uh, the compensation you needed, you could end up in big trouble. So Karas plays rook instead of a3, rook to d8 check, going after the king. The king goes to g7, as it has to. And now here, bringing the rook back to d4, admitting that that was a mistake, was probably the best, but he goes all in. Karras goes rook e to e8, trying to create a mate situation for the king at g7. And uh, the king does look like it's in pretty big trouble. However, now Fisher's queen gets to Rome. Queen to g1, check, is played first before moving the king. King to d2. Queen to f2 check, a double attack, hitting the king and the knight, so he has to move the knight to interpose the check. But now rook to g6. This attacks the g2 pawn, but also allows the king to escape checks via h6 and maybe g5 after that. Um, if rook to g8 check, king to h6. If he takes on g6 and after fg6, black is clearly better, his pawns have been repaired, and with white's king in the middle of the board, Fisher would pretty much be winning. Um, at the rook to h8 check, king g5, rook to d5 check, it looks like white may be getting some momentum, but after f5, uh, black's king is perfectly safe, and uh, he is winning in that position. So instead, white plays g3. Now, Fisher could take on h2. The problem is this, rook to g8 check, king h6, rook h8, king g5, gh4 check, and black is still a bit better, but it looks like Karras probably could... Uh, survive this particular position. But Fisher does, doesn't get greedy. He instead plays f5, a very powerful move, allowing, again, the king to find some squares and uh, just gaining key space. Rook to g8 check. Now the king goes to f6 because that f5 move was played. Rook takes g6, fg6, gh4. Uh, modern computers show us that taking the pawn at h4 is probably best, but Fisher's decision to take on h2, still a, still a good decision, still, still okay. Uh, and he has added this f pawn to the list of his position's strengths. Rook comes back to d4, defending the, uh, the pawn. This d4 square is a very nice square for the rook as a nice anchor point. Queen to h1 with the threat of maybe coming over here to the queen side and causing some trouble. The king goes to c2. That does keep the queen out of b1 at the very least. Um, queen to g2 was a possibility. King d2, queen f1, a3, queen to a1. And this black queen is beginning to become a problem on the queen side. Uh, but Fisher plays king to e5. And now 
knight to c1 was probably best with the potential threat of playing knight to d3 and allowing the knight and rook to control this f5 square, making it harder for Fisher to advance his kingside pawns. Uh, but he instead plays a4, going after Fisher's queenside pawns. Queen to f1 irritates that knight. That's one of the problems playing against a queen on an open board. There are all these little tactical irritations and threats that it can generate. So he's attacking the knight. The knight goes to c1. Queen to g2 check. King to b3. And now pawn takes pawn check. Ba4 check. If he takes with the pawn with the king, then queen to c2 check. Double attacks the king and knight. So the knight has to interpose on b3. But then after queen to b2, he's also attacking c3, and white is in big trouble. So to avoid that, uh, Grandmaster Karas plays king to a3. Now queen to c2 attacks the knight. Knight goes to d3 with check. If it weren't for check, if it weren't check, he would just get mated on b3. So it is with check. King goes to f6, and now knight to c5. He defends the b3 square with the knight from the c5 position. The queen goes to c1, threatening queen to a1 check, followed by queen takes b2. So rook takes a4. Queen to e3 attacks the knight, and knight takes a6. And it looks like uh, Keres has made some nice progress on the queen side, eating up those pawns. The problem is his knight and rook have been pushed to the side of the board, and Fisher has this nice f pawn. Uh, after f4, you can see this is a very fast pawn, not far at all from the queening square. Rook to d4, king to f5 is played. Now, the f3, which looks like the best move, would have probably been a mistake here because then Karas could play knight to b4, and if that pawn continued to advance, knight to d5 check would fork the king and the queen. So uh, Fisher is a little more cautious, and he basically plays king to f5, sidesteps those tactics. The knight goes to b4 now. Queen to e7 pins the knight to the king. King moves to b3 to sidestep that pin, but now the pawn at h4 also falls, and that really helps Fisher. Knight to d3, attacking the pawn at f4. g5 defends it. c4, queen to g3, again pinning the knight. c5, the pawn advances. The rook, of course, defends the knight for the moment. f3, and it looks like we have a bit of a race. King to c4, f2, and now Karas gives up his knight for the pawn. He knew at some point he would have to. Knight takes pawn, queen takes pawn, c6, queen takes b2. So, obviously a queen is much more powerful than a rook, but Karas' pawn is not that far from queening either. How is this going to work out? Well, king to c5. The idea is he wants to play the rook here and use the rook to advance the pawn forward. Queen to c3 check, king to d5, g4. And here Karas makes the most natural of moves. Rook to c4, not only attacking Fisher's queen, but also supporting this pawn's advance to the queening square. There's only one big problem with it. Can you see it? That's right. Fisher plays the move. Queen to e5, check, mate. The mistakes Kara's made probably wouldn't have mattered against any other player in the world, or very few players, but against Fisher, they definitely cost him. I hope you enjoyed the game. See you again soon at Chess Dog. Goodbye.